Uh, so, good afternoon and welcome to the final session of Capturing Conflict, the symposium. I'm really pleased that in this final session we have two real live filmmakers. And um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I think there'll be a different energy to this session. Um, we spent the day looking at work that is already made, if not recently, well, 100 years ago. But uh, with these two to my left, uh, we will be looking at work that is in production or that ha they have made. Uh, they are both very expert uh, in their narrativizing of the 1900 to 1930 period. Um, I'll give you their CVs. Uh, so Andrew Gallimore, um, in grey. Um, <laughs> Andrew is a uh, twice IFTA award-winning director. Um, he has made numerous art, sports and history documentaries for broadcasters such as BBC Two, RTE, Discovery, the History Channel and PBS, as well as, as an extensive portfolio of festival screens for theatrical documentary films. His work includes the historical and cultural documentaries, The Enemy Files and The Treaty 1921, Hawks and Doves, The Crown and Ireland's War of Independence, and Partition 1921 with um, Michael Partillo, uh, and The War Detectives and The Devil's Gardens, and Journeys into Genocide. He is a Reuters Foundation Fellow at Un Oxford University. No, he was a Reuters University Fellow at Oxford okay. University mm -hmm. as part of a programme for international journalists. Andrew has written four non-fiction books, The Devil's Gardens, which is a global history of landmines, co-written with Lydia Monin to accompany a four-part documentary series of the same name, Occupation Prize Fighter, uh, A Bloody Canvas, The Mike McTighe Story, and Babyface Goes to Hollywood. So this, that's our Andrew Gallimore. Ruan Magan here is an Irish writer, director, and producer whose work in drama, documentary, and stadium events reaches audiences of millions throughout the world. His recent projects include Steps of Freedom, the Irish Civil War, 100 Years of Ulysses, The Hunger, Dunhuang, Edge of the World, Pearl Harbor, 1916, The Irish Rebellion, The World Meeting of Families concert hosted for Pope Francis. So no better people to be talking about uh, the War of Independence and Irish Civil War. And, you know, we, we agreed that we'd have a conversation about a documentary and the various creative, ethical and conceptual problems um, and choices that arise when approaching um, making historical documentaries. And I'd like to kick off with you both with a very general question about you know, what would draw you to this part of Irish history um, that in many respects we all know already. You know, I mean, do you expect that there will be revelation in your retelling of the stories or what is it you hope to achieve in, in uh, uh, reviewing this period? Who on you first? Um, I, 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 and that's a great question. I like it. Oh, it's, 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 it's very broad. We're sitting here going, I, I really don't know what to say to everybody because because we, I, I'm sure Andrew feels the same. We, we sort of get immersed in making the films, and there's a oh, there's a thousand decisions that that get that that that, that 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 we use to track our, our progress. But to that question, I have, I have to bring my grandmother up, and Mary uh, knows her or knew of her. Um, her name is Sheila Humphreys. And we've a, there's a photograph, I wish I brought it, of me when I was about four, uh, and I'm in short trousers, I have a little orange dagger here, I've got a little um, um, water gun here, and my grandmother's sitting on a chair, she's about in her 70s I suppose, and my brother's on the other side, Moncom McGann is my brother, and, uh, and, we're, and she's reading Ulica Connor's Survivors to us and indoctrinating us, basically. And, <laughs> and she never left a day go by in her life. And you know this is what she was like, right? With a big smile on her face that she would just find five minutes to, to put, put that seed into both my brother and, and my, my, uh, my, my little brains. And so in a, in, in a sense, it was inevitable. You, you sort of, you, you just every project I felt I've got it. And then one day, I happened to be in the right place at the right time when the Notre Dame 1916 project that Liam Neeson was writing was being made. And I'd done a few before a historical documentary, so I, I didn't know the form, but, but, but I think that was the first time that, that everything collided and I was able to go, okay, because I wasn't so happy with some of the things I'd done before. Uh, and a lot of it comes down to archive, respecting archive, respecting the history, respecting the experts, respecting the knowledge and the, you know, building, standing on the shoulders of giants, as opposed to being a filmmaker who's taking on a big subject and I know, in fact, I suppose, I suppose to experience a large degree of humility over time, 
which is that you are there to serve the story and the audience as best as possible and work in collaboration with people. Uh, I, I, can't, I can't emphasize this too much, uh, just enough, uh, with historians who spend their lives figuring things out. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, that would be, that. There, there, there's, there's my origin story. That's a good answer. <laughs> Over to you, Andrew. Yeah, well, my origin story really is I arrived in Dublin in, I think it was March 91. And so it was the, the 75th anniversary celebrations. And it was really interesting because, you know, I didn't have to assume no knowledge. I had no knowledge. And so that was just sort of really interesting. But I suppose then from a sort of a television perspective, it's, it just seemed that from about 2010 onwards, there was this sort of coming storm. You know, you knew that anybody who was in any way like, you know, in, in, in the documentary making industry, this, this whole decade of centenaries was, was coming up. It was almost as if people were jockeying for position uh -huh. from about 2011 onwards. But it, it was, um, it, it just seemed to take a momentum of its own, really. There was a, a sort of a whole history film industry seemed to grow up around it. And I think, you know, as we got closer, certainly to 2016, that really did take on a, a sort of a dimension of its own. So, no, I have very little sort of a personal connection to it. But certainly, yeah, as, as from an industry perspective, this was on the horizon for four or five years beforehand. Yeah, that's very interesting. I mean, I suppose we think of Misha era and we think of, you know, historical documentaries that do address the subject. But I guess that was 60 years ago. So, yeah, there is a, a, a hiatus between that and, and 2016 approaching. Um, Ruan, can we come back to you as we talk about 1916? and that um, growth of interest um, and that beginning to uh, unpick the, the history. And maybe we might head over to you to set up our first clip. Yeah, okay, I'll, 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 and, and just to quickly say the lens changes, doesn't it? So, so, so 50 years after Richard has been made, it's an extraordinary piece of filmmaking. Mm -hmm. uh, and it does tell the story, mm -hmm. really. But, but then 50 years later, there's an awful lot of thinking going on about it. So suddenly the, the, it's different lenses you have, different nuances, different emphases. Um, like, like I've had the privilege of working in Notre Dame and then we're working at UCC and, and that, that changes. So even the body of experts you're with mm. alters, alters the focus yeah. uh, in, in a very, very important way. So UCC would be all about the people, about the popularizing and, and mm. diminish the significance of the major figures as much as you possibly can. You can't get rid of them. Mm. Um, so, so, so this is Notre Dame, mm. and and it was widely uh, critiqued by some for being perhaps a little bit too too um, I don't know um, in awe of the rebels, mm -hmm. uh, being maybe too republican, too yeah. nationalistic. Um, I Did you have an American audience in mind primarily for this? Yes. Well, 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 a lot of the funding would have come out of American donors, so 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 that was part of it. Um, but interestingly, I'd, I'd, I'd worked and failed several times making, making co-productions between America and, and, and European or Irish audience. It's very difficult. So I think we got it right here, right? Okay. <laughs> having, having messed up a couple of times, and it's all about the language and the delivery and the cadence and the structure and the length of the sentences and all of these really ridiculously small things, which I won't bore you with, but, mm. but it's actually about how, how are you imparting the, 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 the little bits of, 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 of knowledge. Um, so. Anyway, so, so Patrick Cassidy, amazing composer, wrote this fantastic track for, or, um, sorry, score for this. And interestingly, uh, it, it was a long time in the edit, this project. So, so Patrick had the score written well before we finished the editing of the program. So the score actually defines a lot of the sequences. Oh. And you'll feel that now in the bit that we show you, uh, that I show you. So, so you're going to see the opening sequence of episode three. But then I cut out a big chunk and I've jumped forward to the execution, so a tiny bit of the execution sequence of episode three. Okay. So this is the executions of all of the, uh, the, 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 the 16 who were, who were killed after, after the rise. Um, yeah, there you go. Great. Well, Ruan, I mean, one of the reasons I wanted to show this first was we had a wonderful presentation this morning from John O'Flynn, uh, who's just written a book on, on music and film. And I think, John, you'll be interested in this sequence. Um, that's been a really illuminating uh, sequence there um, in in how it draws in you know, archival material, uh, newly shot footage, uh, testimonies that were probably from television archives um, while, while the, the, the people who lived through the, the events were still alive. 
Um, and, you know, it was interesting to see that the stylistic choices you make in this kind of expository documentary with Liam Neeson as the voice of reason. Um, and uh, I, I'm just interested in in attempts towards, you know, telling truths, objectivity, and, and yet clearly there are choices made all along the way. Isn't it, isn't it incredible? That gave mush it again. again. Like the, it is so, so, so it's seen perhaps as, as attempts to be an objective, fair telling of what happened. But of course, it's if anything but. I mean, every, every single thing has been decided to be, to be put there. Uh, let, let me jump through a bunch of things. First, Joe Lee. I mean, he, like that scene pivots on Joe Lee's extraordinary in that uh, could answer this in, in this interview. Secondly, it's a 17 minute sequence that goes on through every one of the, um, the, the executions. And the reason it's 17 minutes was, well, sh sh the story we're always told is that the 1960 rising changed everything because of the reactions to the, of the public afterwards. Mm -hmm. So we were interested, well, well, why did the public suddenly get so moved? Mm -hmm. And the more we kept asking that, we went, well, 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 because there is something inherently perhaps noble, perhaps very interesting, very challenging about what these men did. And, and many have written about the fact that for Pierce it might have been intentional, um, uh, a blood sacrifice. Uh, many have also said that for the others it wasn't, but that they, were, they, they knew what they were doing. And if you look at the, the final letters that each of them wrote, they all seem to go, I'm putting my life on the line for my country. Mm -hmm. And, and, and um, as, as um, Tom Clark's wife just said there, that's exactly what his last words were to her. So, so this is, if you look at the evidence that we have, bear in mind, it is only what we have, and, and maybe some of it is self-referential, some of it is self-serving, um, but it is all we have, um, suggests that this was something that, that, that they, they were pushing, their final push of the, of the rock before it started tumbling down the mountain. Mm -hmm. And so we spent 17 minutes on it for that reason. And when you get to it at the end of it, you feel, holy God, never again, right? That's, that's the feeling. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to show it to you because I've just finished a similar, well, a, a sequence about the executions in the Civil War and the first couple of weeks of them. And we did something completely different with them. We, we could have done the same because they all wrote letters and they all said they were going to die for Ireland and they all were, you know, marching up the hill, going to push the rock over and the whole thing, right? But here, the responsibility is very different. We, we have to try and help the viewer or get them into the space where they can have a conversation with themselves about why the government felt it was necessary to execute young Republicans when it was the, the worst thing you could possibly have done six years before. And suddenly now it was, it was a reasonable thing apparently to do. And, and very few people in Ireland complained about the executions mm -hmm. um, when they could have. They were protesting months before about trying to stop the war, but they didn't when the executions began. So in that instance, we just used one letter from James Fisher back to his mother. Um, I have it, but maybe we won't get time to see it. Um, and then that was it. And we just went, cult, that's it, they're dead. And many, many more were killed and deal with it, right? So. So again, the reason we're doing that is that the viewer then ends up with, well, well, hold on a minute, <laughs> that's not fair. This is a young 18 year old boy just being executed by the state, his own state, uh -huh. for charges which could even be drummed up, he had no defense. So, so, the, so, so all of it, to my mind anyway, is about using the elements that we have to spark a conversation in the viewer's mind. Mm -hmm. So they might look at this 16 sequence and, and hate it, and they think it's jingoistic, non-nationalist propaganda, Fire enough, great, you know, mm -hmm. just get stuck in and mm -hmm. start having having a conversation with yourself. Mm -hmm. That would be, yeah. I think, I think we're okay for time, and I think it would be interesting to look at the Civil War piece. Sorry, Casey, it's yeah. not what I said a minute ago, nice. um, but it's it's uh, Ruan's film uh -huh. too. Um, so just, I, I just have to say, yeah. this is rough cut, right? So, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> this is so exciting right? though. The this music, is the music, the music, is, the music yeah. is, is Natasha Polberg's music, but it's just a computer Sibelius version. I'm doing all the voices, apologies. Brendan Gleeson will do the narration eventually. It's, it's, it's rough as anything, all the captions, for all the historians and audience, you're gonna see mistakes, don't shout. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, we've known each other for years. Um, I, I mean, I know you're an extraordinary archival researcher um, and, you know, you have great skill in unearthing uh, illustrative pieces um, from archives here and elsewhere. And um, I, I 
I'd be interested to hear you talk just about um, about what resources are available to you to tell stories that may practically predate cinema. I mean, not quite, but you know, where there might be few moving image um, uh, artifacts to illustrate a story. You know, what other resources do you have? And have there been moments of discovery that uh, that you have enjoyed? I think you've seen most of the uh, the examples on the screen in the last eight minutes. But I mean, it, it is, I suppose, really, in, the answer to that question is that the uh, the crossing the Rubicon moment clearly is dramatization. That that's where you know that that's the big decision, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, certainly, it it's never been one that I've been particularly comfortable with. I think uh, I mean there are a lot of very good drama docs. It is certainly a uh, a statement of intent. I think you know the, that. It, but I, I think, though, know, the thing about 16 as well, um, in terms of uh, documentary filmmaking in Ireland, I think it changed a lot. I think it changed. It, it, it raised the bar. I think there was a general sense of sort of nervousness about the source materials that we had and that they, they, it needed to be dealt with in, in, in a really sensitive and, and responsible kind of manner. I think it... It changed. I saw Sir Fergal McGarry there on, on, on the last good. I mean, he's actually working as a historical consultant for me on, on a current series. And it changed the relationship, I think, between filmmakers and historical consultants. I think that uh, prior to that, it really was, we just used them almost as a sort of um, a quality assurance stamp, you know? They were a bit, it was a bit like having a commissioning editor. It was just another person you had to satisfy in the chain. And I think the thing with 16 was that, um, we realized, I think, that that had to be a two-way process. I think that, for me, that was the interesting thing about the two clips of film we've just seen. You know, it, it's, ultimately, everything is a is a sort of succession of facts. But, you know, the the one thing, I remember Ronan Fanning was, was uh, our historical consultant on the uh, the War of Independence series we made. And, you know, the, the point he was making was, great, you know, you can come to me with 50 facts or 50 pieces of archive or 50 photographs or whatever. But of course, you know, you have sort of, you know, uh, sins of commission and omission. And so the the way you select those, you could bring 50, put 50 truths on the screen. But does that give you actually a representative film at the end of it? Probably not. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, the, the and so sorry to answer your question, though, I think the way in which we use the resources, and they're very scant, obviously, for 16, yeah. um, I, I think it really did make... It raised the bar, I think, you know, it, I, before then, you know, there was a, a clips of film from the Civil War was thrown into a 1916 doc or whatever. Yeah. There's a lot of that going on. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not really being critical about that. I mean, these are scant resources, but I think that changed. Uh, I think there was a real sense that this, it was important to get this right. Yeah. I think we might have had something to do with that. I mean, I think our unearthing of material in the British Pathé archives and topical budget and gathering it together uh, on the player for the, the independence collection and so on, I think that's helped, you know. And as Kira was, was chatting about earlier, um, the newsreels themselves, whereas at one stage we thought this is an authoritative piece, it may not be, you know, it may, you know, it might demonstrate that a camera person had selected uh, a particular sequence shot. There, there are all of those omissions. There are, I mean, we know that there are, within newsreels, there's material that's recycled. Um, so it might appear in 1916 and again in 1921. So um, it's not just necessarily the case that a bit of newsreel, oh, th that was there, the, the news camera people were there, and this is true. Um, it also gave me a, a whole new respect as well for the work sort of, you know, people working in archives do, because, and it's, it's about sort of almost facial recognition. It's extraordinary. I mean, Talking about the interaction with historians and sort of consultants, I mean, we'd spend hours sometimes just looking at faces to see is that who we think that is, mm -hmm. and you know, you think about you know the, the first or second or even third attempts to catalogue archive. How can anybody be that expert in that in hours and hours and hours of random? Footage. It's so much easier today, isn't it? Because you've got the internet. Completely. You know, like I'm, I'm spent the morning doing Completely. this. Completely. Just saying, I'm doing fact checking. Yeah. And just go tick, 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 tick. And you can, there were two I couldn't. I'd have to go and ask somebody. Right? Yeah. Mm. But the rest I was able to find. Whereas, imagine doing that 50 years ago. And, and you know, sort of, um, even with Pathé, you know, I remember the old index cards long before the website. And, you know, it was so easy to be dismissive of how shoddy it first appeared. But of course, how can you possibly be an expert? Mm -hmm. on such a range of material yeah there's also a problem which so 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 
when, when it came to in 1916, I was stunned to go to the Bureau of Military History or you go to the archives like your own. Um, there is so much material. It's incredible. I go, oh my God, this is fantastic. Okay. No, not so much visual for 1916, but, mm -hmm. but definitely um, verbal testimony, interviews, you know, even though they're all after the, after the event. But, but after you, w w once you spend a bit of time going through this, you realize it's, it's, it's really dangerous territory. And there's an awful lot of self-serving. There's a lot of people who, who will say something, tell you a story that because it's somebody else told them the story, and they tell you like it would happen to them. Um, so you, that means you have to start cross-referencing and finding where they actually there. Um, a lot of these interviews, oh, the amount of times I've rejected one, and the editor, they, by the way, I, I, I'm sure it's safe for Andrew, but the, there should always be an editor sitting here at these things with me because mm -hmm. I make this film with an editor. And that editor is equally important in every respect, mm -hmm. bar the beginning maybe, and the very, very final policy, but everything else is, is shared. So I'll come in sometimes to, to a cut, and okay, you can't use that. And of course he's so involved, it's like it made so much sense. And I'm going, why? We, we don't know that that's true. And you're, but well, why not? She said it, she was there. Blah, blah. Yeah, but, but just, just think about it. Why would you say that? Because it really makes you sound good to Robert Key at that particular point, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. It's suddenly, or I, mean, my, I, I sat and watched my grandmother being interviewed by Robert Key four times, and she hated <laughs> us, right? And the lights and the whole thing, she sweated. She gave him more cake and more cake and more cake, anything not to talk, <laughs> right? And then she would talk, and she didn't like talking. So you can't be certain. The, the interviews, my grandma's given a lot of interviews, the radio ones are fairly spot on. But even so, so the point being that, that it's, it's really, really difficult to be sure that to use a quote is going to be fair enough. Like, did Tom Clark actually say that to his wife? You know, she's much, 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 way, 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 it's 40 years later. Mm -hmm. and, and that feels, but for us, we went, yeah, well, let's put it in because it fits everything else. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of historians have said that's kind of what they were talking about. And the letters seem to back it up. Right? Mm -hmm. But I can't tell you that Tom Clark actually said that to his wife, and I, I don't kind of believe her. Mm -hmm. But that's okay. <laughs> this is my feeling. So, uh, and just one more add to, to that. Then we get to the Civil War, and people don't talk. So the really interesting about the television interviews in the Civil War is the interviewer goes, so now let's go to the Civil War. Oh, I can't remember much about that. <laughs> and I don't, but really, uh, what, you know, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't really get up to much. You're in the middle of this, but no, no, it just slipped my mind. That's what they all did. And it's an extraordinary thing. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, anything that anyone is saying about the Civil War, you have to go, well, if there was this amerta, well, then if somebody's speaking, are they, again, who are they serving? And a lot of the historians are beginning to do work. It's really early days on, on how much of the atrocities during the Civil War were maybe motivated by something else, nothing to do with the anti treaty pro treaty split, maybe it was about local grievance, they had to your land, you go back to the famine, so you might have taken their land, all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so, so we, you, one threads very, very carefully. Yeah. Well, Andrew, let's talk about new perspectives on, on the history and uh, maybe about handing over responsibility for the point of view to somebody else like Michael Portillo. And can you uh, talk about that? Um, about kind of refreshing our sense or kind of drawing contemporary audiences into a new position, a new point of view on the history uh, through uh, an, an outside observer. And you might set up our next clip in doing so. Yeah, it was interesting. I mean, I mean, I hadn't kind of realized, of course, that um, the first clip film we, we saw was for predominantly an Irish and an American audience. You know? And so pretty much everything that I've done on this period has been for an Irish and a British audience. So the dynamic is very different. Um, but I mean, th what was interesting about it was, though, that it, I felt in many ways it made the process easier. I, I think the films we made were easier films to make because basically you had a specific task. It was very focused. That it, it, it was an attempt just to put one perspective over. So, for example, you know, in terms of the executions, um, it, it was what we did was essentially gathered a whole heap of documents, essentially from British government and British military. People who just were appalled at how stupid the whole thing was. You know, what Can a military you, sorry, disaster is, it was. This is in Hawks and Doves. No, this, this no. is going back to the enemy files, the first thing oh, we sorry, did with Patilla okay, was yeah. on, on, the, on the rising. Sorry, yeah. And I, I think what we did by the time we got to the War of Independence, clearly that was probably a more straightforward one again, because clearly you have one big side in the story and you tell it from their kind of perspective, you know? And, and I think 
just a clip by choice. It's very, it's very short, but it, it really was a sort of um, almost a way of putting a disclaimer on the screen. You know that this was not an attempt to be an encyclopedic, comprehensive view of what happened. This was a specific side of one story told from a specific set of documents. I mean, the, the whole point was that everything is told from first-hand documents in, in the British archives. Mm -hmm. um, and and by, by limiting it to that, by maybe constructing that matrix, I think it made the whole process for us much more straightforward. I mean, I sort of, I, I admire this attempt to make this an encyclopedic thing, you know, where you've got, as you say, you've got to try and make decisions as to, you know, how many facts do we need to give a balanced view on something? Whereas, I suppose we weren't really looking for balance, we we're looking for accuracy, but not balance. And I think it's a, it's a more straightforward approach. So Casey, we're, it's, I'll hand out to you for questions now in just a moment, but, um, and it was interesting to hear you talk there about, about British television and, and British audiences, um, and indeed about American audiences. And I'm, I'm just kind of interested in how you're imagined or how you're, the, the audience that you know will be receiving this, whether it's a theatrical audience or a television audience, how does their level of knowledge um, shape your narrative? I, you know, and also, just speaking about audience, how, how necessary is it to keep them engaged, to entertain them? You know, are they issues that you grapple with or do you just go ahead and tell your story anyway? Oh, 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 I, I wanted to hear about that. It's just brilliant. Um, I love it every time. Uh, do you know we, we use the same music as well? Like the opening <laughs> sequence, which is completely bonkers. Um, it's, there you go, because it's, it's an art, it's an obscure library. Um, Jesus, you've got to entertain. Oh my God. Like, full stop. End mm. of story. Like, these things are very well uh, budgeted relative to what you normally spend on television uh, documentaries, anyway. And um, so you've got a brilliant audience. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, 1916 did, I could play it on five continents, audience maybe 30 million. 1916, not so much, but it's still playing. Um, uh, Arte put it out, got two and a half million viewers. APT are putting it out currently. Like it, there, so so you're, you're in audiences of millions for these things, mm -hmm. even though it's a local history of a small pond in the middle of nowhere, you know, like, mm -hmm. I mean, we, we don't, I mean, people don't want to, I, I thought, ah, if you want to know about Irish history, they don't, <laughs> so, so, so you've got to, <laughs> that's right, so you've got to, you've really got to make it sing, mm -hmm. yeah, and that's why Liam Neeson's important, Brendan Gleeson's doing the Civil War, I mean, we don't expect to ever show the Civil War anywhere outside of Ireland, but even so, we want to get young audience in and, and a name like Brenton Leeson, you know, he's in Harry. I told my daughter the other day, he's the guy with the patch in Harry Potter. It's oh my God. <laughs> so like, that matters. This matters. So, so yeah, it has to entertain. Yeah. Right? For us really it was just um, the only big difference between the RT version, and the BBC version really was um, the knowledge base for the script. You know, I mean, um, so let's say, for example, that Michael Collins has mentioned the BBC two version does Michael Collins comma job title comma. Okay. And, and that's mm -hmm. really, the main difference, um, other than that, um, it's, it's funny. And so, so we took a just, just, to, <laughs> just so we wouldn't have that trouble. We went Michael Collins, <coughs> Tom, etc. Yeah. Because because so many people don't know, right? Yeah. It's extraordinary how many people in Ireland don't. Know. I mean, Michael Collins can every now and then probably, you know, yeah, <laughs> but generally everything else, the little explainer helps. Uh -huh. So we made our pace peace with the American <coughs> thing by just actually doing the work with everything. Yeah, and finding the time for that, and to, so yeah, some people. I mean, like historians are going to go, Jesus, I, I know, right? But but I I think I mean for you you tell me, Mary. I mean, you, you you must come across this ignorance all the time. The people just don't know as much as we expect them to know. And then the other thing is, in 1916 was definitely a case in point. I also did a thing called the Hunger, which is about the famine. Both of those projects have, have rated really high with younger viewers. Mm -hmm. So th so there's an appetite in say 15 to 25 year olds to know, and school failed and didn't like it and they but they so they tune into these things on the player and the numbers on the player are massive these things and they tend to be skewed into the younger age group. Mm -hmm. Um so so that's really heartening and mm -hmm. so we always think we're making these for fifteen year old to ninety five year olds. Yeah. Fifteen to ninety five. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um may I throw out uh, to audience for some questions for either of these gentlemen. Mary, yes. Just to say, um, actually, I came across your grandmother in a bit of research I was doing recently, um, 
and on the setting up of Cumann the Saoirse, the pro-treaty women's organisation after the Cumann Man split. And uh, she organised that a few young women would join Cumann the Saoirse as spies to report back to her on what they were getting up to. So she was, yeah. she was some woman. She um, was. I suppose the question I want to throw out there, and a bit controversial, is um, the dependence on the male scholars to tell stories of war. Yeah. I think yeah, I, I, I think, oh, no, 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 that's, that's, that's absolutely fair. And coming from you, it's going to be difficult to, to, to answer the way I'm about to answer. Um, I, I, I just recently done a documentary on, on James Joyce, and it was the first time I've ever managed to get it to be 60, 70% women and 30% men. And we've been trying to do this, no, not just in these historical documentaries, but in the last 10 years and all the bigger documentaries I've been doing. And the problem is, and, and you, you'll appreciate this uh, very much, Mary, is that, is that the, the producers and researchers we tend to work with are women, and they come back and say, we can't find any women. So, so that used to be the issue, right? It's changed. No, no, I know, no, I know you are, and and you have featured in in, in some of these documentaries. So. But I'm not the only one. Yeah, no, and 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 but all, also there, there is a thing of recycling them. So, yeah. so, so, so this is it. Um, we, uh, I, I, I think on a head count, it's it's on all these histories it's about sixty forty, and it should be higher. It should be fifty fifty, absolutely. And uh, well, it is and getting better. It's, it's it's slowly getting better. It's slowly getting better. But I completely take the point, and and it's a struggle we constantly have. Um, I mean, I mean, I, what I wanted to say, and, and I know you're more of an expert on this than me, is that, is that uh, the issue was that, um, that, that because women weren't being, uh, they weren't available because they weren't being given the opportunities, they weren't given the opportunities, they weren't being allowed to publish the books, they weren't uh, mm -hmm. giving the papers to the conferences, and so you had this chain reaction which was holding women back from the entire, uh, from, 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 from rising up to the point where, so, so this is, happily being addressed all over the place now and and so it is changing um, but we're still not good enough i i just in my defense i try very 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 hard and there's all sorts of mitigating reasons yeah but thank you for the question yes shame shame on me yeah. had you had yeah you can, can i can it i mention, been to date. i want to mention something else about my grandmother so Sheila was a woman very inspiring, and she made me already realize at a very young age that women are. But, but she's also been a guiding light in these things because she was an avid Republican at the very, very end of her life. But she did some things which we, not, we may not be so proud of. So, so I'm very proud of her in some ways. And also, so later on in, 20, in, in 1927, 28, she was running, uh, uh, she would intimidate witnesses at court cases. It's and according to she was supposed to ghost. Yeah, ghost exactly. And that, that she may have had a she may have had a unit that that, that yeah. or may or may they not have been unit. So so you have to grapple with these things mm -hmm. a lot, and that's really interesting. I find that very interesting because I love my grandmother, I and mean, she was an amazing woman, and she inspired me in all sorts of ways. But then you've got to go. Well, I don't approve of that though, but I approve of some of the other things she did. So these are really interesting things. And I just thought, thank you mm -hmm. for me. Can I just mention as well, sorry, sir, that um, we had hoped to, Trish McAdam was very keen to join us. Um, Trish, of course, who directed Hoodwinked um, and who's currently in production on a Maud Gone feature film. So she would have been super to speak here. Um, but unfortunately, she's down in Uxerard editing uh, the Maud Gone piece. So we didn't have the woman's voice. I'm the woman's voice. Um, I think that generally over the past five years, I think there are far more women now. Mm. I mean, certainly yeah. in if we just look at the progression on our docs from, from 16 to the Civil War. I think we would have started as a 70-30 split. I think it's pretty close to 50-50 in terms of civil war historians now. It's, uh, it's definitely getting there. Uh, yeah, and, and I just think that the sheer part. volume of, of documentaries that have been made over the past five years, more, more people have taken part in just, I think, yeah. It's it made, a lot. It, it has made the storytelling better as well. Oh, completely, It's, it's, yeah. it's just because men do have a, yes. even if they all are different, if they're Absolutely. arguing, they still have a, the timbre as the yes. same. Whereas, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Sarah, do you have a question? Yeah. It, it's, Partly, it's one related to what Mary had asked, but it's to do with those, and you mentioned it there, those challenging histories that, would you ever encounter situations where you come across something that you have to deal with the commissioner, perhaps you have to deal with um, editors, you have to deal with maybe finances or whatever it might be, um, histories that you think uh, there's no audience for, or that I can't include this because it's challenging or there's no interest in it. Do you ever feel compromised in that way, or an ethical dilemma? Um, not so much in, in this period, I don't think. Uh, I think that uh, there's been a genuine sort of uh, openness to try and find as many new narratives as possible. That, that's certainly what I've found on this. I think, yeah, maybe more generally, possibly so. Um, but I suppose with sort of, you know, revolutionary period histories, 
my experience is the commissioning editors think they're on a, a home run anyway, and that <laughs> the more obscure the narrative is, almost the better. Yeah. This is different. I'm sure what you think. Yeah, I, I, they find that they're, they're also not they're not experts on the subject, um, and so that, that's kind of interesting. They're very good on television, but they're terrible at history. So so you end up you've got a free run, um, mm. and so yeah, I, I think I, I think they allow us to side. And also, you've got to understand there's a there's an army of of, of um, historians involved in this as well. So, so you know, it's, it's not just it's not just us. There's a lot of people who do a lot of thinking on this. Um, I think there was another part of your question I didn't quite. Are there stories that don't get or don't get yeah, favoured? Absolutely. Think it's partly related to not a tendency, but the only histories we have available are those that are told by you know, leaders and politicians in the state and so on. And so we've kind of known that there's so many other histories, histories of ordinary people. It's a hundred percent true. It's a, just like absolutely easily answer that. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. It's very narrow, isn't it? Yeah, you know? yeah. And we are in a decade of, of uh, you know of, of the centenary, so so maybe these things. But but I bet you next year you're going to still be hearing the First World War and Second World War and uh, 1916 again, mm -hmm. and you know, and and you do. And like what's been really interesting, Tiji Gahar, I've been brilliant about this just to go to Mary's yeah, point, yeah. is is putting the emphasis on on stories of women. Involved in it, and that's been just changed it all, and that of course affects the rest of it. And then we all say, "Okay, that's." Um, so, so you could you could keep doing that for the last century and, um, and, and look at more women's stories, because of course the men are in women's stories as well. So that, yeah. that would be one way to do it. But it's a fascinating problem trying to convince people that a story that isn't mainstream is worth telling. Well, I'm just starting. Sorry, just before, uh, filming next week or beginning the process uh, as consultant as well on the same-sex female revolutionaries of, of the, you know, Kathleen sure. Lane, Madeleine French Mellon, and their hidden stories that couldn't be told 10 years ago wouldn't have gotten mm. funded, mm -hmm. um, but it has been, and it's, it'll be out next year sometime, I think. Okay. So those hidden stories are, are great, I think, like the films that have come out over the last decade mm. and the documentaries have been just fantastic. Mm. A whole new generation of people now know uh, and yes. the, the archival materials do exist, like and Keepers the of the Flame, the you yeah. know, where you just need a creative yeah. spark where it says, oh, we will approach it this way and we look at yeah. uh, the, the, the widow's uh, uh, responses or the, their experience and so on. So, that yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it, it was a super piece, but it's, yeah, it's heartening to know that uh, there are stories still to tell and whether it's new perspectives on, um, on a past that we think we know that kind of refreshes that or whether there's, there's still hidden stories that we haven't done. But I'm going to go away now with Mary's question in my head, and, and I'm never ever satisfied, right? I always think, like I'm really at right now in Civil War, trying to make it as good as good as good as possible can. The minute I finish, I probably actually feel I've aged already, <laughs> but the minute I finish, I'll hate it. And just go, that was crap, sure it was awful, like it. I have to do better, and the next like time it's got to be, you know, and that's it. Yes. But you no, know, this is it. And so you're constantly learning, and it's constantly changing. And, and I can think back to documentaries I made 15 years ago. I, there was no women in Mm -hmm. You know, and that was okay then. And, mm -hmm. and so this is, it's always changing, it's always altering, and that's mm -hmm. kind of what makes it a little bit exciting, really. That, that you know, and you're never, you're ne we're certainly, you're probably saying you're never happy. No. No. It's, it's <laughs> like, it's just, are, we, are we over the Saoirse moment? I think we're not going to get to see Saoirse tonight, but I'm thinking about the George Morrison documentaries. You know, you have, you have Michelle, and it's the big, you know, national story, and then you have Saoirse, which has the question mark. And you know the third documentary doesn't get made. Do we reach the end of the Civil War period um, with some very messy history, um, and do people lose interest, or have we got over that? And are we telling more diverse stories? Uh, and, and I have to set Andrew up on this because <laughs> so 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 the last so the third episode of the Civil War thing I think is the real that the we're making is it, it's. It's it's very interesting. It's it pulling us and pulling you, and this is you start seeing the Ireland of all the troubles that we experienced since then emerging, and um, just literally just in the space of about four or five months, fascinating. Um, and then I just learned we've never met, right? <laughs> and I just learned about what he's doing now. To tell them it's just an incredible. So this answers your yeah. I mean, basically, we're making a um, uh, a sort of a political <laughs> legacy two part for. RT essentially looking at the joint histories of Fine Fáil and Fine Gael, and this it's supposed to be anyway ready for the the transfer of the the Taoiseach's office uh, in, in December. Um, but it's um, I, and to be honest, I, I think I'm I, and I, I suspect it's more to to your sort of more emotional point about the fact that 
you're always ready to move on to the next piece, you know. And I, I kind of already prefer. I think that's a bit a better Civil War film from us than our Civil War film mm -hmm. already. Yeah. Um, and so, but I think that might be the novelty of the. Uh, I don't. I don't think so because because really early on in the Civil War thing that we're doing, which is just like what happened. This is how to play that. We were already regretting that we couldn't get into the messiness of the 30s and 40s and 50s, because yeah. that's really interesting. Yeah. And so when I heard you were doing that, I went, oh, that because it's a perfect, uh, yeah. uh, you know. Yeah, and it's this whole concept of state building and nation building and the differences between them and all that. Mm. It's fascinating stuff. Mm. It's, uh, it's good. John, yeah. Briefly, I, I know you're on a fresh return, Steve. Um, it's great. It's f fantastic to listen to the stories behind the stories and, and the way you're making them. And I was particularly uh, pleased to hear about the popularity, so to speak, at uh, 15 year olds can be characterized, you know, and, and how places like IFI make that available. Because I'm from the generation that was schooled in the 60s, when we got no education whatsoever. Our, our education stopped at the, you know, the active union. And, oh. and it's taken a long, long <laughs> time so to self-inform on that. But I want to go back to just one element of what you've been talking about. Uh, Rowan, you mentioned, uh, obviously, the Kilnockton piece behind this in Boston. Um, to what extent, if any, do the funders, the people who enabled the production to be made, um, you know, in one way or another, subliminally, if not overtly, influence the, the, the way the story is told? Well, I, in my experience, I'd honestly say not at all. Mm. But the subliminally is an interesting word. So how, <laughs> much, how much do I bring them? Mm. Mm. Now, not to satisfy them. I, I did a lot of work with Dennis O'Brien for a while on the Irish missionary history. Mm. OK, so. So I, 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 I spent a lot of time with Dennis about I can't tell you I know him at all, right? So, so, so did I subliminally try and please him? No, because I don't know what he wanted. He never actually said it. And, but he did want, you know, to, 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 to talk about the significance of this, mm. of this movement and 100 years of effort by Irish men and women in the missions, which is generally it's a positive thing. You can um, criticize him in a lot of, a lot of different separate areas. So, so, but it's, I use that as an example because the money came from him when I made the documentary they put me went down RT. Um, so, but I never asked him, never showed him a cut, never did anything. Same with Notre, Notre Dame, they didn't, they didn't look to see. It's, it doesn't, doesn't happen. But, but does one fall into line? Well, well, you have been commissioned to make something. Mm -hmm. And Brian and Nick Dermott, it was all over the, the 1916 thing. And Brian, if anyone's ever met her, has a very particular <laughs> right, mm -hmm. idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's obviously going to, and she probably was carrying something of her, she, because she would have pitched it to Notre Dame initially. So, yeah. so there's, there's definitely always going to be that that, that, that goes to the room. But, but, um, but I've, I've never had anyone. No, I think one thing that changed as well, it's funny, uh, it's only just occurred to me. One thing that did coincide with this period of, of, of filmmaking is the fact that the way a lot of television stuff in Ireland gets funded has changed because of the BAI's yeah. sound and vision scheme. Mm -hmm. And the thing about the, that scheme is, you know, it, it's, it's tough going in terms of how much, how prepared you have to be before you even put an application in. And I think that therefore changed a lot because Essentially, these days, you have to be pretty much prepared to go filming as soon as the thing is greenlit. So mm -hmm. in many ways, the old fashioned way of making something and then a commissioning editor coming in and saying, no, that's not what I want. Mm -hmm. Those days have gone because essentially the opportunity to say this is what I want has already been. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's for the better. I think a it's for the better for two reasons. First of all, I think we're better prepared going into it. Mm -hmm. and, and secondly, yeah, there's just no interference essentially afterwards. Good. Good. Thank you. Yes, really interesting because again, we have never met. So I thought, oh, is that a. So it makes me think, because yeah, because the amount of work that we would, that definitely I would do, I'm sure Andrew's the same for no money, mm. months of it in advance of mm. doing a project, um, to get it to a point where the script is really, really solid. Now, then you give it to a historian and go, are you kidding me? It's fun, but but, yeah. but it, it, it's got the mood, the feeling, the history, the facts, the shape, why we're telling it all there. Mm. Um, and that's all been established. So the commissioning editor gets to look at that and they go, yeah. Gone. And then they, they don't really same responses, same with everybody. It's 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 fascinating. We don't, we don't really get that much in, in, interference. I wonder will many of the people in this room be deconstructing your work in the classroom over the next period, and they'll be showing off and say, "Well, I met them in person, <laughs> and I know why they did make these choices." And um, I think if everyone has uh, asked everything it is they want to ask, um, and we've we've sucked you dry metaphorically. Um, <laughs>
Um, <laughs> I'd like to thank you both uh, really sincerely. I think it's been a really interesting uh, end to the day uh, to meet uh, real life filmmakers and to have you speak so honestly and so uh, interestingly about your, your practice and, and the work you've done. And it's nice that you two get to meet and you played so nicely together. <laughs> so thank you all very much.